Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and we're here to preserve and promote culture, one weekly conversation at a time. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show through iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, Google Play, and a whole bunch of other venues. Just visit our sites, chimeraobscura.com slash vm or vmspod.com to find more information, along with our RSS feed. And follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod. Well, I'm uh, headed into a busy mode. For, for March, um, got a workshop up in Boston this week, uh, congressional briefing next week. Week after that is at home, but then there's a four-day pharma event in New York City afterwards, and then there's all the regular old work and, and the show and, and all that stuff. I um, I feel pretty on top of things at present, uh, especially because I'm a week ahead with the podcast for now. Um, if it weren't for that, I might have a lot more anxiety uh, heading into to March. I mean, I've always got anxiety, but I'm talking about the more generalized, overwhelming, paralyzing form as opposed to the acute, man, who am I going to record with? But anyway, um, all that means I'm going to ride the waves of, of business and, and podcastery and, and come out the other side, or, or so I hope. And there's no guarantees, of course. Um, last week in the introduction, I talked about my good friend who got diagnosed with a brain tumor and I'm uh I'm waiting for new he's waiting for news on that I'm waiting to hear from from him and I can't give you any update but uh I do want to thank everybody who sent me nice notes after I I also wrote about it in this week's email but uh his experience of really no symptoms at all and then surprise you've got a brain tumor kind of you know, reminds us or reminds me of the uh the lack of guarantees all around so well, that depressing shit out of the way. Let's dive into the show. Um, my guest this week is one of my favorite repeat guests, Willard Spiegelman. Willard has a brand new book out now from Knopf called Nothing Stays Put, The Life and Poetry of Amy Clampett. It is a um, Nothing Stays Put is a remarkable book, um, not least because Amy Clampett's life presents some weird challenges for a biographer compared to, to that of, of other poets, maybe. Uh, Clampett rose to fame as a poet beginning around the age of 58, and she only lived another 16 years before her death from ovarian cancer in, in 1994. So she had a pretty meteoric rise as a poet, but there's 58 years before that that kind of need to be reconstituted and, and brought into a biography. And... Um, like I say, it's it's a bit of a challenge as opposed to somebody who was publishing from their 20s onwards or something and has more of an ongoing public face and public record. But but Willard does a masterful job in this book of of building up what we know and can't know uh, about Amy's life, starting in New Providence, Iowa in the, the 1920s through her her early years in New York uh, after college, um, where she tried in vain to, to publish novels and, and travel essay collections and and then up through her through her years of, of activism and then into her her years of fame which began when a, a her boss submitted some of her poems to the New Yorker without bothering to tell her in, in the late 70s and throughout the work he he incorporates Amy's poems and how they speak to, to various people phrases or phases and, and episodes of her life, often obliquely, as as is the nature of her poetry. And because she was such a late bloomer and there's such a profusion of poems, she published five books in those those sixteen years between first publication and, and her death, <clears throat> it's almost like an inverse history of her and her, her work. And because Willard is such a I'll just say a good professor of modern poetry and a good reader of it he does a great job throughout conveying what's special about Clampett's poetry, what meant so much when she burst on the scene, and how he sort of teases out certain lines and stanzas that, that show what make her what made her her special, and what led to certain types of backlash uh, against her work after a few years of success. 
in a sense, it's both a biography and a, a sort of primer of uh, about her poems. And as someone who considers himself a poetry moron, as you guys have heard me say over the years, <clears throat> I really appreciated the care Willard brought to those parts and the the attention he he pays to the poems and and how they reflect and and refract and and otherwise transform Clampett's life and the reading that made up so much of her life. This is a biography that doesn't, you know, it doesn't show us what the, the writing process was like for a, for a poet showing us, you know, draft after draft and where things got changed. But it does show us the life that has to be lived and the world that one has to engage. And I mean, spiritually, politically, socially, sexually, to bring out art. You know, how you, you can't just be isolated. Um, even so much of her poetry was about about the natural world. But anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm talking too much about that stuff as opposed to what Willard brings out in the book, which is the world she lived in, both the human one and, and the natural beyond it, and how it informs her poems and how her poems, her poems help change people's lives, which is a really neat part of the book when you, you get what readers, how readers responded to her work and how they, some thought she was this young poetess because she had just come on the scene um, and what it meant to them to, to find that this is a woman who'd lived a full life at this point. But anyway, Nothing Stays Put gives us just what the subtitle of the book says, The Life and Poetry. It's um, it's a really amazing achievement. I enjoyed the heck out of this book. And it, it actually has me opening up the one volume of Clampett's poems I, I own, uh, her penultimate collection, Westward. Also, as I mentioned, Willard's a repeat guest, and our first session, depending on how you count it, uh, it goes all the way back to 2012. So he is someone I've met through the show and have managed to stay in touch with for, for more than 10 years now. And we've recorded, this will be our fourth episode together, but we've stayed in touch for, over the years. And I know I've, I've gabbed about it before, but um, it really does mean a lot to me to, to have these these sorts of relationships through the show and to, to get to know my guests over years and years and to see how their lives have changed and to see him working as a, a biographer, um, sort of charting the process and, and changes of someone else's life. I like to think I, I at least provide some of the material for that for, for biographers in future. Now as caveats go, um, there's just some background noise because it's New York City. Uh, the mic levels were kind of high, um, so we come in hot. I kind of lowered the gain on these things. Um, I've set them lower for the, the next in-person session I do. I don't know when that's happening. But uh, also the Barbara Pym novel he is reading, um, it's an academic question. He mentions it at the end of the book, picks it up, shows me, and I should have said it out loud, but I did not. So when we get to the, hey, who are you reading? That's who he's reading and what he's reading. Now, here's Willard's bio from the book. Willard Spiegelman was, for many years, the Hughes Professor of English at Southern Methodist University in Dallas and the longtime editor of the Southwest Review. Since 1987, he has written about books and the arts for the Wall Street Journal. A recipient of fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, Guggenheim, Rockefeller, and Bogliasco Foundations, he is the author of eight books of literary criticism and personal essays and the editor of Love, Amy, The Selected Letters of Amy Clampett. He currently lives in Stonington, Connecticut, and New York City. And now, the 2023 Virtual Memories Conversation with Willard Spiegelman. What drew you to Amy Clampett? As I said in the beginning of this book, I was one of the readers who, beginning in 1978, saw her work appearing in The New Yorker and other reputable places. And like everybody else, I was taken aback because these were poems, the likes of which had not been seen in a long time, if ever. Um, these were poems that had perhaps the most distinctive or important hallmark of any work of art, they had a distinctive style. They were not like anybody else's poetry. 
And you could say right at the beginning, and then for the 15 years of her fame, you could say, well, she was influenced by Keats. She was influenced by Hopkins. These were the first poets she read and loved. And then later, she was influenced by the Wordsworths and Emily Dickinson, especially when she taught for a year at Amherst College. But she was always unequivocally and unmistakably her own. So that was in 1978. Several years later, after the Kingfisher came out in 1983, I was sitting in my office and I got a phone call from a woman who worked at SMU in the, she was in the administration in some office. And she said, I've been told that you, you are the person who teaches contemporary poetry. Do you know of somebody named Amy Clampett? I said, sure. <laughs> she said, well, she's my cousin. Would you like to have her visit? I said, sure. Uh, Amy was, I think, going to Austin. She must have had an invitation to go to Austin to read at UT. And she was going to stop and visit her cousins in Dallas or suburban Dallas beforehand. And so this woman called me up and said, would you like her? And so we did have a reading. So that was when I first met her. And I would say that was 83 or 84. And then the following year, 85, 86, I was living in Manhattan where I had a fellowship to and was living at the 92nd Street Y. It was, I was connected to the Poetry Center there. And that year I saw Amy and her then uh, consort or partner, soon to, later to be her husband, Hal, many times. Uh, we had dinner, we went out places, we were at readings. And then after 1986, until her death in 1994, I would see her occasionally in the city. And during that time, as a magazine editor, I also published her. I published her poems. I published her prose. And at the same time, as a critic, I began writing about her. So I knew the, I knew the terrain and I knew the woman. Uh, and then she died. Uh, and her collected poems came out posthumously in 1997. And I remember writing a long essay about them for... Perhaps it was the Kenyan Review. I think it was. And um, her widower, Hal, was so excited uh, that uh, he kept me in mind for when he died, which was in 2001, right after 9-11, he wanted me to do a collection or a selection of Amy's letters. So we're tracing the path sure. up to this. So in 2003 and four, uh, I was living in their cottage in the Berkshires where a lot of stuff had been stashed. I, don't, I didn't realize how much stuff was there. Uh, and I did a selection of the letters which came out in 2007, published by Columbia University Press. One of the things I said in that book was that a, a biography of this woman would never be possible because she uh, became famous only very late in her life, and there's no paper trail, and all the people who knew her are gone or forgotten or dead, you know, one way or another. It's inaccessible material. Flash forward to 2018. Uh, the Clampett Trust came to me and asked whether I might be interested in doing a biography. And I said, what I just said to you, a biography really is impossible because of these reasons. And then I said, well, you know, here I am. I've retired. Um, I don't have anything else to do. I like having a big project. I've never written a biography. I have no idea how to go about it. Yeah. But one of the things I say in the introduction is that I firmly believe that if one is a rational, sensible commonsensical person, all of life's important decisions should be made on impulse <laughs> and whim. Whim is a great Emersonian word, <laughs> whim. Put yeah. whim over the lintel of your door. Uh, so I thought about it for a minute or so. I said, okay, I'll write a biography. Now that's how I got into it. And what I then discovered was that I had been initially wrong 
the amount of stuff that had just been accumulating in a dusty storage shed in Adams, Massachusetts for 20 years uh, wasn't as big as the papers that had gone to the Berg Collection at the New York Public Library, of which there, I think, were 84 boxes, but it came damn close. And so then for 20... 19, from the spring of 2019 until March of 2020, when the world shut down, uh, I was at the Berg Collection, going through every piece, turning every page, as Robert Caro <laughs> urges us to do. Turn every goddamn page, is what his, <laughs> his editor said to him when he was a young uh, investigative reporter. Um, so I was there, and then everything shut down, and then I started going to the storage shed in Adams, Massachusetts, and doing a kind of triage, opening all of these boxes and saying, this one looks interesting, let's start with this, and then taking them over to the office and going through them, and then taking another box and another box until I went through everything, and now all of that stuff is being cataloged and will eventually find its way into the Berg collection at the New York Public Library. And that's when I realized what it's like to write a biography, or let me qualify that. That's what made me write the kind of book that I did write, acknowledging all of the lacunae, the, the things that will remain forever mysterious. And it's a point of some legitimate pride for me to say, and maybe other biographers will say the same thing, I know more about Amy Clampett than anybody else in the world. <laughs> yeah. Even her one surviving brother, who is now 93, to whom she wrote many, many letters, and to whom she was very close, even he said to me, I didn't know that. <laughs> she never told me that. I didn't yeah. know about this person. I didn't know she went there. Um, and this is only because I'm the only person who has read and turned every page. And so I began assembling this stuff. Hmm. What, did you, let's see, what did you have to learn about biography as an art? I did, well... I could say both everything and nothing. Yeah. I had to learn everything because I'd never done one. Uh, and I could say nothing because nothing that anybody else has said or written or could tell me was, would necessarily be of use. That's what I wonder whether there was like either templates or there is. advice There's a or very, recommendations. Oxford University yeah. Press has a very nice series called a, the Very Short Introduction Series. Mm -hmm. About this big. Uh, and there was one written by the great biographer Hermione Lee called A Very Short Introduction to Biography. And I read that, and it was very useful, mostly uh, as a history of how biography has been thought of, going back to Plutarch, for example, uh, and then working up through the Renaissance, and then Dr. Johnson, and then the 19th century, the big, thick, three-volume uh, life and works biographies, and then to the psychopathographies, uh, Joyce Carol Oates's term, for many 20th century writers. And all of these are interesting templates or interesting ideas none of them was really either applicable or helpful yeah. to me because what I had was a mass of material. And I don't think at the very beginning, but certainly quite early on, I realized that both in this particular case of Amy Clampett and this particular case of Willard Spiegelman, who is essentially a reader and a critic of poetry, that this writer's best biography is the story that is told through the poems. So um, I was able to use the poems, not in a simplistic way, but I think in a meaningful and helpful way, as a guide to the life. They come out of the life, and they may reflect the life, and in a very real way, because she was so bookish, they constitute the life. To anybody whose primary allegiance is to libraries, encyclopedias, mm -hmm. museums, reading, it, it is going to have a life that is best reflected or best measured by what he or she reads and how she reads 
and what she does with her reading and how the reading weaves itself into the fabric of her art. That's not true of all poets, uh, but it's certainly true of somebody like her who was, and many of her uh, uh, critical uh, uh, readers or uh, un unsatisfied readers will say it's too much of the lamp, smacks too much of the library, it's too pretentious, it's too referential. One of the things I say is that I think that's a kind of condescension being directed at her in part because of sex. Yeah, I was going to say because of a her it's so particularly, her. yeah. Would they say the same of Milton or Ezra Pound or Shelley? I mean, deeply learned poets. I mean, Milton is the most referential poet of all yeah. time. Uh, he spent seven years when he, you know, after he, after he got out of uh, Cambridge, Milton came home and at to Horton, and said to his father, "I think I want to become a great poet. I think I'll just stay here in the library for seven years." That's okay. There was no no impulse. There was no com compulsion to go out and earn a living. Right. So he became Milton. Uh, but I think it was because Amy was bookish and she was eccentric and she was, and this is a, 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 a group that still exists under different uh, coloration or feathers, she was one of those weird Greenwich Village beatniks, uh, the little old ladies with pencils and the buns of their hair, and who was just going to everything and reading and writing. And she was also a very enthusiastic, girlish kind of person, rather than deeply or apparently deeply thoughtful. She was giddy. Yeah. And that made her even more suspect. And she says in an early letter, why are people so afraid of being enthusiastic? Well, I was just going to cite that, that, yeah. that wonderful line of hers about, yeah, just show enthusiasm. It doesn't matter if you're right. That's right. Just, That's right. Yeah. And the other thing that people would resent her for was this sudden, unexpected, unexpected by her, fame. So it was interesting when uh, her star began to rise, it didn't begin to rise, it just shot up. Uh, she was happy. But she was also terribly confused and depressed. And it's an interesting phenomenon, I guess you would call it fear of success, that what troubled her at the beginning was not so much the hostile reviews. Her friend Karen Chase said that she remembered every nasty word ever said, but the infinite praise of Helen Vendler was a kind of kingmaker. And Helen Vendler said, this is the greatest poet to come along since well, we don't know who. And Helen Vendler put her on the front page. And that sent her into a tail tailspin. The criticism she could deal with, because it was just a heightened version of being neglected, and all of her prose writings, all of her efforts to write fiction, came to naught. So she was used to rejection for 25 years, trying to write fiction and get it published. Nothing happened. And then all of a sudden, the poems get accepted. And she is just undone by that. And for a while, had to resort to some sort of antidepressant or pharmacological um, medical way of, of staving this off. What do you think she avoided or wouldn't acknowledge that sort of destiny of, of being a poet? For all those years, working on fiction and, and travel writing and essays and everything and just never having the, you know, maybe I should just try my hand at, at poems. This, this is the most important mystery and fact about her life. One of the epigraphs to the book is the Latin motto, Poeta nascitur non fit, the poet is born, not made. And in her case, that's not entirely true. <clears throat> To the extent that the poet was born, we can look at her and say she was given to language at a very early age. She talked early. She wrote early. She went to school and thrived in school. She uh, wrote, you know, teenage girl poems. And when she was in high school and college, she wrote uh, adolescent yeah. effluvia. And she said that when she went to when she came to New York at the age of 21 with the goal of being a professional writer, in her mind, this was not unique to her. It was part of American culture, but she obviously bought into this. Being a writer meant writing fiction, the so-called great American novel. And she had all of these ideas 
for novels. And when she was in school, when she was in college, she did write you know, some short stories and sketches, little prose pieces. But she lacked the essential qualities that a novelist needs. One, the sense of a story, a plot, things yeah. happening. Two, even more important, the inner lives of people. How do people work both in themselves and with other people? She had no idea. And this is also why at the end of her life, when she was hell-bent on writing a play about the Wordsworth Circle, she couldn't do that either. This was not her métier. It was not her genre. I can't think of any other writer, self-conscious, intelligent, creative, gifted, who took so long to discover the right genre. And some of her friends said that when they were young in the 40s and 50s, they would get together in little groups in her tiny uh, Greenwich Village walk-up studio apartment and have dinner or wine, and Amy would read from her latest work, and they would leave the apartment, and they would say, Amy's a puppet. <laughs> uh, the, the, book, the books, the stories, the novels are filled with gorgeous prose descriptions of nature. But her sense of people was zero. Mm -hmm. I mean, she just, she just didn't understand how people operated. That's not good if you're going to be a novelist. Sure. <laughs> her path to becoming a poet had several jolts in it, or several things that started the engine going. But it was a 20-year period. In the mid-50s, she had an experience, which she describes in a letter to her brother Philip, the one who was still alive, of going during Easter week to the cloisters and um, sitting there and seeing the sun coming in through a stained glass window and hitting the stone and listening to recorded Gregorian chants at the same time. So it was a kind of moment of grace or revelation, and it just dazzled her. And she describes leaving the cloisters and walking down to the subway with the sun glowing and shining everywhere, feeling somehow that she had been touched. I mean, it really was like some religious thing. And she got home, and she began writing about this in her diary or notebooks. And she said, and all of a sudden, as though they had a mind of their own, the words on the page started developing into lines of poetry. The lines broke from prose into poetry. And then she wrote out of this a long, very diffusive, not very good poem called The Sun on the Stone. Hmm. That was 1957. She put it away, and she was still plying her craft or trying her hand at writing fiction, which she gave up in 1966. She finally got her last rejection, and she said the hell with it. At that point, for that past decade, she had been deeply involved in high Episcopalian theology. She thought even of maybe becoming a nun. In the mid to late 60s, her attention strayed from religion to politics, and she turned away from the church. She turned away from the church for two reasons. One, she came to three reasons. One, she came to realize as a woman, as a feminist, that if you were a woman in the church, they're very good at letting you set out the uh, plates and polish things, and, but they're not going to let you become yeah. a priest. And she bridled with that. Two, um, she had become involved with a man who became her life partner, who was Jewish. And this alerted her to the fact, which is quite plain, uh, that she had never been sensitive to before, that there was a history ingrained in Christianity of anti-Semitism. Yeah. And Hal's uh, mother's family were all killed in the camps. Mm -hmm. And so this virulence of anti-Semitism drove her, in part, away from organized Christianity. And three, she found a greater sense of um, 
community in political activism than she had found in the church. So starting in the late 60s, when she met Howe and then moved in with him in 1973, she was getting encouragement from him, personal and professional encouragement of a sort that she had never had from any person or any man in her life. And she began writing poetry more seriously. So now we've gone from 56 up to 66 or 67, 68, let's say, and then flash forward to the last thing that gave her a jolt. There were two thing, more things that gave her a jolt. I'll come to the last one after this. In the fall of 1977, she got up her courage to go to a creative writing workshop at the New School. And again, she was like all of those uh, earnest, sometimes middle-aged, yeah. often women, people, who decide they're going to be a writer. And she went into a class. And her teacher, and I write about this, was somebody who was in every possible way the antithesis to everything she valued and worshipped. Mm -hmm. He was scrappy. He was... Uh, radical, r r radical aesthetically, and not just politically. Um, his aesthetic was that of America, Walt Whitman, Charles Olson, experimental poets. Amy was worshiping the courtly muses of Europe. Yeah. And he opened her up to an American aesthetic. And she was writing the stuff, the things like the stuff for which she became famous, which was entirely different from him. And he said, God, this is so wordy, this is so pretentious, this is so Baroque. And I asked him in correspondence, he has lived in Germany for decades, I've never met this man, Daniel Gabriel. I said, do you think that you are responsible for this? And this is a question to which there is no answer. One answer is, Amy was by this point confident enough in her own gifts so that whoever her teacher was and whatever that teacher said to her would not, it would not deter her in her ongoing quest. But two, it may have been that Dan Ga Daniel Gabriel was so antithetical to her that it confirmed her sense even more of what <laughs> I want to write and yeah. what I'm going to do. And we'll never know. You know, there, there, there is the old Zen proverb, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. Yeah. And so he was the teacher who appeared. And from that moment on, 1977, that's when the poems, at, at this point, by the way, a little privately printed chapbook uh, had appeared in 1973. Uh, and then another chapbook appeared as a result of work she had done at the New School. And in these little chapbooks, there are poems that bear a little bit, a little bit of a resemblance to what came later, but she never reprinted any of them. So her work exploded in 1977. And the first poem that she had published by The New Yorker, which she did not submit, but her, <laughs> I found her, very funny that, her, yeah. her boss sent it in to his friend Howard Moss. The first poem she had published was something that she had finished in January 1978. She sent it off to The New Yorker. It was sent off to The New Yorker, I don't know, a month or so later. It was accepted in March. It appeared in July or August of 1978. Yeah. Now, you can say that's fast work, but it was fast work that was 40 years, you know, just 40 years gestating. Exactly. Uh -huh. And then, and the interesting thing, another interesting thing about that poem, I mentioned the failed, long, diffusive poem that she wrote at the cloisters called The Sun on the Rock. The first poem published was called The Sun Underfoot Among the Sun Dews. And that's a poem set in Maine. And Maine was the other thing that galvanized her. Starting in 1973, she and Hal spent a month every summer in Korea, Maine, and all of a sudden, the landscape just spoke to her and inspired her. And she said that for those, uh, well, almost 20 years, uh, every summer, she wrote more in the summer in Maine than the rest of the year in New York. Maine was like her native Iowa in an entirely different key. There was water where there had been prairie. But Charles Olson was very attentive to this as well. 
prairie and water, land and water. And Amy said that she could only write about Iowa after she had gotten away and was living in Maine. And the other factor in this was the fact that she found the Maine lobstermen, the fishermen, the down easters, down easterners, whom she uh, was friendly with up there, very much like the laconic farmers yeah. she grew up with. So it took one landscape to bring out the other landscape that had always been in her. One of the things I say is that Amy had to get away from Iowa in order to write about it. James Joyce had to leave Dublin. Dublin did not leave him. Willa Cather got out of Nebraska as fast as she could. What was her subject? It was Nebraska. Yeah. So this move is a move away, nothing stays put, is the title, but it's also a confirmation of things that are there with you, that you bring with you. Do you think of her ultimately as a rural writer versus a New York poet? No. Uh, she called herself a poet of displacement. Yeah. Uh, she is a poet of location, but the locations are three. Well, four, really. New York City, Iowa, Maine, and everywhere else. Uh, poems about her travels in Europe, for example. And some of those is a wonderful poem, which is one of my favorites, called Losing Track of Language, which is about a train trip from uh, the south of France over into Italy. And it's about the experience of being in a compartment with somebody, and you bond over language. This is a uh, an Italian who doesn't speak English, but they speak a combination of French and Italian, and they talk about Petrarch, and then they talk about Sappho, and they talk about all of these poems and poets in different cultures and different languages. It's a fabulous poem, and it appeared in 1985 in her second book. But the incident on which it's based was from a, uh, a trip she took in 1951. It had just been simmering in her notebooks, and I've seen the description uh, or, the, or the rendition of this experience in the notebook. And it's not really like the poem at all. Yeah. Not at all. So it took 30 years for that to simmer. And the, the lack of, we'll say, fidelity to reality, to, to being willing to take the, the reality and then transform it into something as opposed to trying to chronicle, chronicle what was there. Yes. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yes. Well, one of the things, she was trying to, to sell her wares in the 40s and 50s. Uh, in addition to her novels, she was trying to peddle travel essays. Because yeah. when she was traveling, first in 1949, then in 1951, and then subsequently, she was taking massive amounts of, of observations and notes in her notebooks of this picture and that man and this scene and this church. <laughs> And she was writing them all down, brilliant descriptions, and she sent them off uh, <clears throat> to several publishers, all of whom sent them back, saying, well, this is all very nice, but what does it amount to? Yeah. You know, here's something, and here's something, and here's something else. The, the dots aren't really connected. So perhaps her gift was for observation and then rendering in a very discreet and meaningful and powerful way a specific moment or a specific item. That's what a lyric poet can do. But if you're writing a prose narrative, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, you've got to have a string taking all of these things yeah. together, putting them all together. One of the things that strikes me within the book, and it, it's the, for me, the, the you know, the, the, the comp, I guess, based on my podcast history is Langdon Hammer's bio of Merrill, which is a very different and hugely encompassing project, which Langdon will never forgive me for because I read it over the course of two weeks and it took him 12 years to write. But anyway, um, your integration, not just of poems, but of your interpretations of the poems mm -hmm. and using those not in a chronological way necessarily and not the, and then she wrote this and this mm -hmm. is what was going on, but sort of feeding backwards into her well, life. I, I said yeah. at, one, at one point in the book, I said uh, the poem, she didn't develop as a poet. Yeah. And there were five books, and some of the poems were about things from 30 years before, yeah. and some things uh, that appeared in a, a later book could have gone into a former book. So it really doesn't matter how yeah. you look at the poems. And your decision to, to use those throughout right. the book That's as right. a form the, 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 the last yeah. book, A Silence Opens, 
is slightly different from the ones that came before. And her editor, Anne Close, said she had a, a, an eerie, weird premonition that this was going to be Amy's last book. And she handed the book in a month or two before she got the diagnosis of ovarian cancer, which finally killed her 18 months later. But there is a sense in A Silence Opens of new things happening. Maybe there's death there. There's, uh, there, there are kinds of strangenesses and formal strangenesses in that book, too. So where she would have gone and in what direction, we don't know. But otherwise, I think I was right, and you were right in observing this, that the poems uh, did not develop uh, uh, the way Merrill's poems or Lowell's poems did. Yeah, yeah, I can see with Langdon, you know, there's a reason to show it, to show what was happening in the life that led to that particular That's right. thing, where, That's again, right. this is much more, let's say, ambivalent, I guess, or ambiguous. 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 Yeah. Is there a, a Holy Grail document you wish to God, you know, I wish there was just this one clarifying thing about X, Y, or Z in her life? The I Columbia uh, period seems like the one you'd love to have known more about. No, but, no, but, I don't think so. No? No, certainly not at the university, because like many people, I mean, even today, somebody says, oh, I'm going to do a master's degree in this, and they drop out yeah. immediately. No, nope, this okay. is not for me. Uh, it would have been nice to know more about whom she was seeing and what she was doing once she fetched up in the village. And I try to piece things together, but so much of it is unknown because she didn't write it down, and because also, as, as all of her friends said, she was very private. She would tell you exactly what she wanted you to know, but she wouldn't reveal everything. She was the least confessional, however exuberant and enthusiastic she was, she was the least confessional kind of person, both in speech and in writing, and even in her diaries, yeah. which are meant to be private, I don't know. But still. Somebody's yeah. going to read them if yeah. you save them. Uh, even in her diaries, she doesn't say, we did this, or I loved him, or he loved me. She's sort of going at them glancingly. I was talking about this last night. There's a playwright at Yale named Donald Margulies. Do you know that name? No, no, I don't. Uh, and he wrote a play called The Complete, The Collected Stories, or The Complete Stories. And it's a two-person play. And my neighbor across the whole hall is a woman, now an 80-something-year-old woman, who was a stage actress and was on a soap here in New York for 30 years. And she uh, is in charge of something uh, at Ethical Culture on Central Park West, <clears throat> excuse me, in which they have play readings uh, and then talk about ethical implications of the sure. plays because this is ethical culture. Deeds, not creeds is their motto. And this was about a student and a teacher, a woman a uh, novelist or short story writer who lives alone in Greenwich Village and a student of hers who becomes her uh, protege and then who becomes a writer on her own. And the story, the play hinges on the fact that as she is developing, the younger woman takes and cannibalizes the major event, the major story in the senior woman's life about which the older woman has never written, takes it and makes it the basis for her own first novel. Yeah. And the question is, was this an ethical thing to have done, to cannibalize yeah. this love affair? The woman is supposed to have had, the older writer had a love affair with Delmore Schwartz when she was 22 and he was 44. That was the story. Uh, and then, but she never wrote about it. And then the younger girl, said, but you gave it to me. You told me about this. Why shouldn't I write about it? It's a whole so, monster thing. Yeah. That's right. So it's a very interesting ethical question. So with regard to Clampett, the question is, who were the men? Did she want to write about them? Would knowing who they were in any way affect our understanding or appreciation of the poetry? I doubt it. I doubt it. The poems stand on their own. There are no love poems. Well, there's one, uh, the wonderful poem called A Hermit Thrush. Uh, but it's she never mentions Hal in the poems. She dedicates a book to him, but she never mentions anybody by name in the poem except a man 
named Jan Muller, who was a German painter her age, who came here um, during or after the war, got out of Germany. And she says she traveled with him in Harlem uh, in 1940-something or other. Why does she mention his name? Well, the names of other friends and family. I mean, the names, are, she says, my mother, my father. But she never mentions names in the poems, except for this one guy. Is that meaningful or accidental? I don't know. I don't know. But it gives that poem, said to Correr, the, the hunger for fleeing, the hunger for running away, uh, a new kind of um, uh, weight, I think. Did you have qualms, uh, qualms about, I mean, you mentioned a potential invasion of privacy thing in the introduction, you know, as you were exploring. But well, I, I mentioned this last night at, the, at this play meeting. I said, any biography is an invasion of privacy. Yeah. But a writer who saves everything and does not burn it and who gives it to a library intends for somebody to read it. And... Does she think that somebody is going to read it and say, that's nice, and that's all the person is going to do? There's clearly a wish. This goes back to our early discussion of why you save things in the first place. Okay. The wish to have some kind of protection. Maybe there were many diaries she threw out. Maybe there were love letters which she threw out. Love letters that she wrote or love letters that she received. And all of her correspondence to the uh, the woman who became the nun end up getting destroyed because of the uh, the, the convents. The, the convent would not allow that policy. Yeah. Yeah. It was very yeah. interesting talking to the nun, who you know is still alive. This, this is a woman from an aristocratic wasp preppy family in Boston. Her yeah. father was the first head of uh, the Rockefeller uh, Foundation retreat at Lake Como, the Bellagio Study Center. And she was a girl at 16 or 18. She went to college for a minute or two. And then she said, this life is not for me. I'm going to become a nun. And she did. And so she fetched up in uh, Kent, East Mall, West Malling, uh, in, in England and became a nun. And then the mother superior there. And I interviewed her in 2019. Um, nuns are great. <laughs> <laughs> there is nothing sanctimonious about nuns. They are tough. She would say, we are tough broads. Yeah. I mean, she and other people were giving out condoms at, uh, at, at some you know, sex <laughs> rally. Because I mean, they, they knew, they know reality. These were not cloistered yeah. nuns. Yeah. They were out in the world. But their own lives were uncloistered, uh, were, were very cloistered. Yeah. But they knew how to see the bigger world. That's right. You refer to, well, you mentioned interviewing her, but you refer to your, your sources as informants uh, in, in the late stage of the book. Mm -hmm. Did you have that sense of, of investigating or, or you know, the, what led to informants, I guess, is a, a, a term I use? They provide information, yeah. and some of them are people whom I didn't meet. Uh, that is, some of the informants are people who had done long interviews with a woman, a um, a, a sort of oral biographer, mm -hmm. in 2007, and others with two other friends of Amy's in 2002. So at least we had written, taped, and then yeah. transcribed evidence of what these people said. Uh, so they were giving their version. And all of these reports just indicate the truth that no one is the same person to everybody in her sphere. Sure. However, there are all, always overlaps. So you start to see a picture developing. I treat my friends like terrorist cells. So I, I only give bits of the, the plot to each one of them so they can never, and they generally don't know each other. So this way they'll never be able to, to put the whole story together. Um, unless, again, I, I get investigated by somebody. Oh, I mean, uh, uh, a biography uh, comes out someday. But right. Chances are right. not so much. But what I found interesting, you know, reading the book and seeing the little authorial I'll say intrusions or the... the my, my authority. Yeah, intrusions. So the moments you step in <clears throat> occasionally. They're interesting, and yet the fact that you had much more direct experience with her that does not make its way into the book, I find fascinating that you had a, a, 
a lot more interaction that could have turned into my impression of, of Amy was this. No, 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 You don't go. No, 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 My interaction with her was entirely of a a superficial sort. I mean, having dinner it's, with her a couple of times. There's still, there's still name-dropping aspects of that you could have employed and didn't, um, oh. you know. But yeah, I the, wasn't keeping a diary. Yeah. I wasn't. I didn't go home and write down everything she said. Someday I have a very I bad. Yeah. I have a very bad memory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, that, that choice of, of even slotting yourself in a little bit within the book, just well, describing some of the going to, to visit the um, going to Iowa, for example, mm -hmm. and then things like that. Mm -hmm. Well, there are people. I guess the greatest example is Leon Adele, who worked on Henry James for decades, mm -hmm. who simply come to identify with their subject. Henry James, say moi. I yeah. am Henry James. And then there are other people, like the late James Atlas, writing about Saul Bellow, who come to hate, <laughs> hate it. Yeah. Or Lawrence Thompson, writing about yeah. Frost. Or Ian Hamilton, writing about Robert Lowell, you know, they came to hate their their person. I came to like Amy very much. And as I say in the book, I'm sorry she died because she would have had more poems. Yeah. And I would have known her a little bit better if she had, had she lived another decade. Did it change your appreciation of her poems? Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, because I had to read them as More slowly. Yeah. Well, no, 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 no. no. Th that was the use I was uh, yeah. making Sorry. of them. Uh, I had to read them. Uh, more slowly and more carefully. And when you read something or look at something or listen to something more slowly and more carefully, it seeps into you and becomes part of you. And you get to not only know it better, but love it better, unless you turn out to hate it. Yeah. Uh, but I didn't. I mean, some of the poems are a little bit less impressive than others. The method gone mad. But that's true of almost every great poet. You know, you think about the realms of poems and somebody who was a poet for a long time, like Lowell or Merrill or uh, John Ashbery or Wallace Stevens. And every time I open Ashbery or Stevens, I'll open the collected work and I'll say, I've never read this before. <laughs> this rings no bell. <laughs> And sometimes I will open the books, especially to have Stevens and Ashbery, who are naughty poets, and I'll say, I don't understand this at all. You didn't and, mean naughty and not naughty, right? Yes, okay, naughty. Sure heard not, that. Naughty so, with a K, yeah, not, okay. not naughty with a G-H. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, and then the question is, the question is, I don't understand this. Is it my fault or is it the poet's fault? And in the case of the great, I'm willing to put the blame on me, but sometimes one gets frustrated. Yeah. But I never found that frustration with, with Clampett. I would just say, oh, God, this is more of the same. And, I mean, even a great writer like Virginia Woolf has moments where the, the method just goes wild and it's not as impressive as it is otherwise. You know, Wallace Stevens said, all poetry is experimental poetry, mm -hmm. even though it doesn't seem to be. Yeah. Um, and so sometimes the experiments bear fruit. And some, it's like planting seeds. I mean, we're talking about somebody from Iowa. Yeah. You, you plant the seeds and you hope that they will take root and spring up. Yeah, how much did visiting Iowa help? Oh, Not enorm just in terms of the, the, the people and interaction, but the environment. Yeah. It, 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 a lot, a yeah. lot. Because I saw the landscape and it's, it, it, it really does show how important place is. The other thing that was important to me was going last summer, this is after the book was in production, um, with a bunch of friends from Stonington, we did a day trip to Amherst to visit the Emily Dickinson house, and tour, which I'd seen maybe 40 years ago, and it's now much more of an establishment than it was then, and to see um, the gardens, and to see Emily Dickinson's grave. Uh, I stumbled across it last November. It's, it's 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 one of those. I was at school there for four years and never bothered looking. Well, of course. But this time I was walking down Main Street, just saw some old cemetery on the that's side, right. like, and there it is. Come over and just take a look, see what's right. there. I had no idea. What's behind barbed wire? It's, yeah, it's, 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 it's a, a, a yeah, big metal fence clamp clamp blocking it. But, but yeah. uh, and it says uh, Emily Dickinson poetess. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but this was very important to me. And there's a poem that Clampett wrote called Amherst. 
uh, at the end of her year there, this would have been May uh, 1987, she was on a picnic at uh, Emily Dickinson's grave. And she was writing about, she was looking out over the cemetery with uh, Amherst College war dead from all of the wars. Yeah. And seeing the grave and seeing the names of the war dead and seeing the mountains, the hills of, the, of central Massachusetts going up and seeing Emily Dickinson's garden and knowing how um, careful a botanist she was and how careful a naturalist she was made me appreciate how Amy came to identify with her, not just as a poet, but as a woman. Um, when she was in her years of reclusiveness, people were amazed at the fact that she was both reclusive, but also very garrulous, garrulous and nervous. And when, when, uh, Dickinson's admirer and pen pal, Colonel Thomas Wentworth Higginson, came to visit her in Amherst. He, he was so terrified of what she might be like that he had questions that he had written down. That he, and, <laughs> but once he began talking to her, it wasn't really he who was talking. He was overwhelmed because she was just gushing, and, and it, it just terrified him. And he ran, uh, he he ran from the place, you know, like uh, uh, escaping, never having heard such volumes or torrents of conversation. And that uh, uh, volubility, that garrulousness, that was the way Clampett was too. And so she could identify that way uh, as well as in so many other ways with Dickinson. Do you so see anyway, this, this, is, yeah. this is an answer to the question about place. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And of course, I know the West Village, so I know what it's like there. And I did take it uh, last week when I was at the, um, uh, at the Whitney. I was walking by uh, down West 12th Street, and there was Amy's house. I took a picture at 354 West 12th Street, which is now right in the heart of the most expensive real estate. <laughs> you do have that listing description in, in the... New York. <laughs> and she, she's right around the corner from the Whitney. And... Uh, <laughs> Did she ever know that she was going to be living in the lap of luxury? Uh-uh. Yeah. Not for $43 a month or whatever yeah. it was when she was there. You do mention some friend in the building who will never forgive her for not mm-hmm. buying into the, the co-op That's right. thing and, and you know, That's buying right. the, the, the apartment. Cause, yeah. um, but do you see somewhat in the way that you know, um, she has Dickinson as a, a precursor, are there contemporary poets you see as, as strong Amy Clampett? I'll say devotees, followers, successors. You know, it's interesting. She, this she is, seems this, very unique. This is, uh, very unique. She seems know, unique. And this is exactly right. <laughs> yeah. And she's like Dickinson in this way. Uh, every, every, many writers say Dickinson is my favorite poet. I was most influenced by Dickinson. I don't see any Dickinsonian here Dickinsonian echoes in anybody's poetry, nor in Clampett's poetry, uh, and this is why I said at the very beginning of the book that when these poems appeared, it was quite evident that they had a style that was like nothing else that had been ever seen or heard. Yes, you could hear Gerard Manley Hopkins and Keats double-barreled epithets. You know, lots of big mouth filling words uh, and Clampett said that when she came to New York the first book she bought at the Gotham Book Mart w- was uh, collected poems of Hopkins uh, and these were the people from whom she learned but I don't know who how can you imitate this yeah. and yeah. it's so unfashionable now too it's it, both in its style and its subject matter mm-hmm. you know, she's paying homage to the dead white men of western civilization another reason that people uh, were against her yeah and that's exactly the era in which I was going to college, mm-hmm. right in the middle of her, her stretch, mm-hmm. that 89 to 93, and mm-hmm. being at Hampshire in particular, mm-hmm. right near Amherst, when that was the, the movement. It was very much, you know, I, I could see how she'd be reacted against mm-hmm. strongly uh, from, from the way you, again, you characterize her influences and everything she was about. But, <coughs> but you know, like many people... Um, 
who go into teaching, and she didn't have to do it for a career because she was poor and didn't have jobs. Yeah. By the time she started uh, getting asked to do workshops, or she said, I have no idea how to teach writing. Yeah. And uh, it's funny, the play I mentioned uh, from last night, the woman who's based a little bit on Grace Paley, uh, the woman who uh, was the one of the two main characters who wrote only short stories, never wrote a novel, said to her, says to her student, I don't know how to teach writing. I can only identify you as somebody having promise and try to bring you out, but I can't put you through paces to make this work. Yeah. Uh, and Amy to try to get uh, people to pay attention to words. That was all she could do. So a word that occurs repeatedly in the book that I, I was curious about, genetic. You just, you, you, you just use the word genetic often enough that it, it, it struck me as this sense of, of lineage that you see in, in her, her father, grandfather, her, her mother's side. Mm -hmm. You know, can you talk a little about her father and her grandfather both wrote. Um, her grandfather especially um, he wrote a memoir. He wrote poems. Now, a lot of people wrote poems, even farmers, but not yeah. too many of them did. And uh, people wrote memoirs in the same way, I suppose, now that people will do Videos. I was just going to say like a TikTok video about themselves. Yeah. Right. Uh, well, no, no. <laughs> no I mean, a longer form. Being, yeah. being yeah. interviewed. I can think of relatives of mine who, for their yeah. 70th or 80th birthday, were professionally interviewed by somebody who either recorded it uh, in a visual medium uh, or who then took it down and, and wrote it as, you know, the autobiography of or my memories by. Uh, but both Roy and Frank, the father and the grandfather, did these things. And um, the grandfather especially was a great reader. And Amy's first book she got when she was two years old. And uh, she liked reading. And she would um, curl up in her grandfather's study and read. The mother, who was the more mysterious figure because women were silent, had gone to college uh, and majored in what would be the equivalent of home ec. Uh, and she played the piano and was a musician. And they had a piano at home. Uh, but they were poor. One of the things that interested me was that in the middle of the Depression, when only 15% of Americans, mostly men, had any post-secondary education, the Clampets sent all five children to college. And because they were Quaker, they had a strong interest in education. And because they were Quaker, they believed that the girls had as much right to an education as the boys. And even though they were Quaker and were committed to this, after Amy's freshman year at Grinnell, her father wrote to the dean and said, I don't think Amy can come back because the crops weren't good this year and we don't have any money. So they worked out some combination of, it seems the figures, a couple hundred dollars, yeah. seem laughable now. They worked out an arrangement with a combination of scholarship and work study so she could complete her Phi Beta Kappa honors mm -hmm. degree. She was asked in one of her interviews, did she ever consider going east to college? And she said, no, we couldn't afford that. We were poor. Yeah. They were poor, but they all went to college. Mm -hmm. That says something about a commitment to learning. And this is not necessarily, I, I don't want to say this is only Quaker. No, we have the, the people of the book. You know, we're, the, uh... the people of the book, <laughs> that's right. Or, or it's, it's also the American immigrant story, or has been, on the, whether, the, uh, whether the genus is... Jews or Italians or Koreans or Southeast uh, Asians or Nigerians or Ghanaians, you come to America and the people downstairs in my building here, Koreans, Christian Koreans who run the laundry, their kids are both engineers. Yeah. You know, or they went to MIT or something. That's what happens. I'm sorry. That's what used to happen yeah. in America and still does in some circles. But I, I'm afraid that dream might be fractured, might be eliminated now. 
and we can get into larger sociopolitical issues in, in later in the conversation. Well, but this is, the, the, the larger sociopolitical issues are things which Amy was deeply committed to, yeah. uh, simultaneous with writing poetry. Yeah, I thought it was a really... I don't want to say fascinating reading, but you know, I, I, I was I appreciated the segment where you, you kind of focus on on that aspect, and with Dickinson also showing how just because they're not explicitly writing about either the Civil War or mm -hmm. Civil Rights Movement, Vietnam, etc., those things are permeating the the poems. Those mm -hmm. are part of the the world she's writing about. You just need to learn how to read and and understand a little better. That's right. What's going on? That's right. I, I did ask Henri Cole, because you mentioned him in here uh, a couple of times in the book, if he had any questions. Uh, he just said, ask Willard about feminism in in Amy's mm -hmm. work and Amy as a person. So, you know, you will satisfy Henri on this one? Sure. Uh, like Elizabeth Bishop, uh, who was only nine years her senior, uh, Amy bridled at being thought a feminist poet. Uh, Elizabeth Bishop would never allow herself to be included in women's only anthologies. Yeah. Amy was never asked that kind of question, but she probably would also bridle. I don't know. It was a slightly later. Uh, in many ways, Amy Clampett, by some critics, was said to take up the mantle of Elizabeth Bishop, not necessarily with regard to style, but maybe with regard to temperament. Elizabeth Bishop died in 78, 79. It was exactly the moment that Amy came on yeah. the scene. Now, that's merely a coincidence. A coincidence. Uh, Amy was involved in political issues. Uh, less the women's movement than the, or even the civil rights movement, that was part of it as the anti-war movement. Sure. And that's the Quaker part of her. But in one letter, she says, I think my next, and, and, and housing uh, for yeah, we that welfare. Like the civil rights aspect of it. That's right, yeah. welfare. Yeah. She said, I think my next uh, uh, big commitment will be to uh, prison rights having bailed out one of her comrades from Rikers Island in a very funny poem yeah. called Amaranth and Moly about going to get this welfare mother out. Uh, and she makes it fun. Yeah. It's, it's funny, too. <laughs> but prison rights, that's, that's what's next. Mm -hmm. And she had read prison memoirs from Attica and reports about Attica and places like that. Um, so to that extent, she was politically involved. Because she was a single woman either by chance or by choice, she never suffered from what Betty Friedan called the feminist, the feminine malaise. Mystique. The fem, the, that's yeah. right. Okay. Fe, female mystique. Yes, the, the, the malaise. That's right. In the opening paragraph of, of the female mystique, Betty Friedan talks about the malaise, the silent malaise that is creeping into all of these suburban women's lives. She never had that. I mean, she wasn't, she wasn't uh, doomed and damned to... Uh, making cookies for the Cub Scouts and taking yeah. kids to soccer practice, she was she was working, or in many cases living in poverty, so she didn't suffer from those suburban uh, dilemmas. Uh, to the extent that she showed that a woman, and she had an aunt who was a role model in this way, one of her father's sisters who had gone off to Chicago to be maybe a milliner or a hat designer, and then came back to Ames, Iowa, where the, uh, Iowa State is, and set herself up there. Amy had a role model of a woman who could live without a man and have a successful life. And to that extent, she did. On the other hand, according to some of her friends, she really wanted to get married. <laughs> so, is this unusual? No. It just, it speaks to the unspeakable mystery at the heart of all being and the complexity. She wanted to get married. She didn't want to get married. Is this Mr. Right? Is that Mr. Not So Wrong? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and these are things that we do not know because these are the things she didn't talk about in her poems or in her diaries or to her friends. So that's where the biography has to be different from something like Lanny Hammer's book about Merrill. Where there's so much, yeah. Where there's yeah. so much, or, yeah. or a yeah. biography of Lowell, 
uh, or the well, cannibalizer. Too much, perhaps. Yeah. <laughs> And that's where the real unethical use of things uh, comes in. I was mentioning this last night uh, when Lowell quoted from Elizabeth Hardwick's letters uh, in his poetry. Yeah. And, and didn't always quote, but made it seem like he was quoting. And, yeah. and Bishop slammed him and Adrian Rich slammed him. And Elizabeth Bishop said, I think, I guess I think art is just not worth that much. Yeah. It was a violation, but he was he was an epic poet. This is the Whitmanian, I contain multitudes, and I contain my wife's letters, and I will put them to use if I choose to. So there's a kind of modesty. But Amy, you know, she wasn't going to um, wi women's support groups. Yeah. Or Conscious, consciousness, consciousness raising groups. Consciousness think of being raising. Yeah. I mean, her consciousness yeah. was plenty raised, yeah. I think. I think. It was hers. That's right. Yeah. That's right. So when we talk about the unspeakable mystery and, and the nature of biography, it's been 10 years since you and I first recorded, and this is our official fourth time, actually fifth. Mm. How have you changed? What's, what's changing Gosh. your life over 10 years? Well, I've gotten old. There's that. I mean, I got cancer, for Christ's sake, so that's, that's a thing. But, but I, I, I haven't you? had that yet. <laughs> see, you've got something to look forward to. <laughs> but seriously, the 10-year thing, how do you see? I'll give you, I'll give you a really superficial yeah. answer to that. And by superficial, I mean... Um, Afraid to look inside? No, I'm no, kidding. No, that's no, me, not you. No, no, I'm, no, I'm no, 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 no. The usefulness of trite cliches. <laughs> yeah. I left Texas on the day of the summer solstice, June 21st, 2017, and then I returned to the East Coast. And during the first year, people, all sorts of people, would ask me a question or variations on a question that began with the three words, do you miss, yeah. fill in any direct object you want. And I realized after the first several dozen of these encounters, the answer to the question was always, no, I don't miss anything. Teaching, that was fun, that was then. Dallas, that was fun, that was then. Being an editor, that was then, that was then. This is now. Looking back with nostalgia is the inevitable balm that old people have. When I was young, when I was strong, yeah. When I was in my prime, oh, the deeds that I could do. And looking back is a way of, I suppose, keeping you sane, but it can also make you grouchy. So don't look back. Look ahead? I don't think so. Because <laughs> we know the future is getting closer and we know what that is. So in a very Zen-like way, I am living in the moment. This is it. Okay. I have this is uh, this is uh, out of the mouths of babes department. I have a friend whom I've met only twice in my life. Once at a bed and breakfast in Houston, Texas, many years ago, and then in Santa Barbara, California. But we bonded. She is an artist. Her name is Barbara Conviser, and she said to me, she has one child who lives in. Uh, Santa Barbara, another child lives in Austin, Texas, and her granddaughter in Texas, maybe now she's 10 or 11, when she was seven or thereabouts, Barbara was talking to young, whatever the kid's name is, and said, Wendy, what's the, what has been the best day of your life? And the kid said, today. Today yeah. has been the best day of my life. And her grandmother said, well, what about yesterday? And the kid said, yesterday was the best day of my life until today. I thought, boom, this, this kid is a genius. <laughs> I wrote a whole book and I didn't have to. <laughs> Total genius. So I'm taking my cue out of Wendy, whose name I don't remember, but I call her that. So I, I've changed. I'm much more alert to life's. Uh, impermanence and fragility. Over 10 years, people have died and they will continue to die at a more alarming rate. And we often say, as a, a line in a Wordsworth poem, who next will fall and disappear? 
uh, you look around and see the people dropping and you wonder who's next. In fact, the last time you and I saw each other was at not, Harold, not to record, at Harold Bloom's. Yeah. Yes, I remember that very well because I had interviewed Harold in September 2019. Oh, wow. I was going to ask when you, you had because he's an, he's an informant for you and I know he right. died... October. That's right. I saw him a month. I, 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 I went to Lanny Hammer and I said, would you please come to Harold's with me? I, I need a sort of bodyguard. I don't oh, yeah. know. No, I, I entirely understand. <laughs> and, uh, and we went and we spent oh, maybe a half hour and he gave me some good juicy tidbits. Yeah. And that was good. Uh, this is an aside, but one of the things about writing a biography is that once somebody dies... You can make up anything. So, I mean, I could say Harold Bloom said to me yeah. thus and so, and he's not. Another person in that same category is the publisher who was uh, Amy's boss, Jack McRae, mm -hmm. the great man of American publishing. He died last week at the age of 93, and I saw him bedridden with multiple sclerosis in the summer of 2019 or maybe 2020. I don't remember living down at London Terrace. And he was a phenomenal presence in American pu publishing. Um, I interviewed Harold in 2019, in September, and then he died. And then that January, there was the memorial service uh, at the chapel at Yale. And I remember seeing you there and seeing many, many other friends. And then there was a reception afterwards, but it had begun to snow. Oh. Oh, I know. <laughs> and I didn't want to. I'm a timid driver, and I thought, I don't want to get, get caught on I-95. This is what I was trying so to I remember. Left, I, I, yeah. I left without going to the reception, which I was told was quite wonderful. It was, it was a blast. It was at the Beinecke. Yeah. So what happens is I've been recording that morning. I had two podcasts in Jersey City that morning, drive up to New Haven direct uh, from there, go to the, the event. They invited, it was a one o'clock event or something yeah, like and that. And they, they invited me because they were using my audio uh, of the, the Bloom interview as part of their, their Right, of Penny thing. and Penny Lawrence's big slideshow. Yeah, and, and I apparently got something out of Bloom that they were not expecting to have heard. And, and this is all back in 2016. We record, yeah, 2016. Anyway, um, we leave and, and open the door after the, the event, just like you were saying, and it turns out it's been snowing horribly. And what goes through my head is, well, shit, when am I going to be here again? Mm -hmm. May as well do the, the reception. And if things are bad on 95, I'll, I'll pull over somewhere. Things were bad on 95, but I did the whole thing anyway. What should have been an 80-minute drive was over three hours. And I'm sitting there white knuckling the whole time on those long hills and rises of, of 95, just thinking, ultimately, it was a good day. If I make it home alive, it'll be a great day. This will be fine. My wife is texting every 20 minutes with, have you pulled over yet? Or are you, something? no, no, everything's fine, honey. It was not fine, but I got back safe and sound and I got to pay my respects to Bloom and, and mm -hmm. you know, uh, get to see you one more time before the world shut down. And mm -hmm. Which raises my second question, besides the 10-year thing. How was the pandemic? I mean, oh, you worked I loved on the it. book. I, I, I loved it. I yeah. loved it. And I'll, I'll tell you why. Uh, several reasons. Um, two years of house arrest. <laughs> what could be better? So my cartoonist friends were all about that. They were like, what, nothing changed in my life. What could be better if <laughs> yeah. what you like doing is staying at home and reading and writing and watching television and listening to music? I had the advantage... I have the advantage of living in a charming seaside town. We were socializing with people out of doors. Mm -hmm. uh, and let's see, everything shut down. It was March 10th or 11th, everything yeah. shut down. And then gyms and places reopened maybe four or five months later. My favorite memory is going to the senior citizens' grocery store hours. You know, only oh, yeah, see they were doing six, the, six the, to seven. Yeah, that yeah. was the most crowded time of the day. Right. I mean, that was the biggest germ <laughs> spreader of all time. You go into the stop and shop, and you see a thousand old people walking around. Uh, but you know, like many people, uh, I got COVID. I don't know how many people I know have had it, but many have. We have all been quadruply, quintuply vaccinated. Yeah. In my case, it's only because I had a test. I had a I had a cold. Th that was it. Uh, and then, and that was in 2021, January 2021. I and my partner both got it. Flash forward to 2022. 
we were in Paris and came home uh, in October of 2022, and he came down with it again, but I didn't. And we all know people, you know, a house of five people. One person gets sick, the other four don't. I got whomped Christmas Eve this year for the first time, and... Amy and I made no accommodations because she figured, oh, I've already been around him for three days. Well, that's she never right. came up positive. No, she, she tested negative the whole time. Like, okay, whatever. That's right. And this is all scientifically interesting. Yeah. Uh, the anti-vaxxers, of course, go hysterical with this. But, uh, so I, but, but anyway, um, two years of house arrest, great. Helped me with my work. Yeah. Uh, but also, it was temperamentally pleasing. I didn't have a job. I do feel sorry for those friends, mostly educators, who had to accommodate themselves to Zoom. And for many people, it's a temperamental thing, but also an age thing, many of the older people said, you know, I was hanging in, hanging on for another year or so, but I can't do this. And so they stopped right, right away. And the virtual learning, this will be talked about for years to come. I was speaking to friends here in the building whose son just graduated from the University of Pennsylvania. I said, his college experience was not like ours, was it? And they said, no, he was home for much of it. So two years of your life, you're not really at school, but you make accommodations. And the real sadness is for preschoolers and young kids. And every statistic indicates that there has been damage. One doesn't say irreparable. But there was damage done to the learning capacities of children who are at six, seven, eight, yeah. the maximum optimum time for acquiring knowledge. And the switch was turned off. However, human beings are infinitely um, adaptable. One of the things I heard early in the pandemic, you'll like this, is that people were worried about babies. Why? Babies respond to people's smiles and faces. If you're wearing a mask, how is your baby going to relate to you? And the answer is through the eyes. Yeah. Uh, I uh, learned to be eyebrows, much more expressive. Yeah. Eyebrows. <laughs> that, that, that's exactly right. So that's an example of something. Yeah. At, at trade shows, like in, in convention centers, I'll still be masked up indoors generally, unless it's a huge spread out thing and I'm sitting in someone's booth, at which point I'll, I'll take it off. But yeah, I have learned to show much more with, with my eyes and, mm -hmm. and face, given the, mm -hmm. you know, the amount of, of work I've done just with my lower face all these years, I realize now I need to do facial exercises. But um my sort of last question, given the book is just coming out now and we're, we're you know, you've got a, a way and ahead the, of you. The grand tour is about to begin. Yeah. <laughs> Other biographies? Do, you, do, oh, you, no. do you feel the bug at all from, oh, from this process? Oh, no. Is well, there someone else? Well, well, first of all, I'm too old. Second of all, I would consider it only under the following yeah. circumstances. One... It is a person whom I have always admired. Two, it is a person whose life could be done in a short period. That is somebody like Amy, who's, for whom the resources are limited. But I don't want to be like Robert Caro. I mean, he's been doing this for 50 years. Yeah. Uh, so I can't do anything like that. I mean, the pictures of him at the LBJ library, you look up, <laughs> it's like something out of, of um, uh, Indiana Jones, or the last scene in Indiana Jones, where you see the temple of the Ark being put into the Smithsonian with mile after mile of boxes. Uh, no, I could, I could consider other, perhaps, biographical writing. But I, I do think that... There are professional biographers. Brenda Wineapple, living writer, is a very good one. Mm -hmm. uh, she's doing other things now. And Hermione Lee. Yeah, I was going to say, you mentioned her earlier. Yeah. Well, it's very interesting. I, and I have told this story before. 30 years ago, when I was chairman of my department, we were courting Hermione Lee. Uh, whether she was seriously interested or just playing the academic game, I don't know, or just testing the waters and seeing what happened. And so she came down and did the requisite dance and flirtation, the 
this lecture, that seminar, this dinner, this uh, uh, meeting with a dean, et cetera, et cetera. And then she went away and the department gathered to take a vote. And the department was very enthusiastic, maybe three to four to one against her. But there was a vocal minority, maybe six people, five, six, seven out of 24, 25, mostly young people, who said, no, she's under-theorized. And she is a mere biographer. And biography is a sub-mimetic genre. Now, this is the age of high theory. And it was the age of the death of the author. And being a biographer is like writing for People magazine. You know, it's, it's one step of, uh, up above the, the gossip mills. Yeah. But she's Amazing. a great biographer. Richard Elman was a great biographer. But these are people who devote... And her... her um, Tom Stopper book. Oh, yeah, I've got it. It's, it's, so, it's, it's sitting it's, right in front of me on my, my it, desk. Was it 1,200 pages long? <laughs> How did, and, and my friend Rosanna Warren spent more than 20 years writing about Max Jacob. And she was doing her research in France I and mean, crawling around in archives uh, and Bibliothèque Nationale. I, I couldn't do something like that. If it was easier and you were younger, is there a subject you would have, a person you would have wanted to tackle? I would have liked to have written about other writers whom I admired, like Wordsworth and Keats, but they had already been done. Sure. Now, the difference there is that Wordsworth was fairly unpleasant as a person. Keats was very pleasant as a person. Mm -hmm. I, I would like, uh, that's the answer to the question. I would like to write a biography of somebody in whose company I would like to spend time. <laughs> and I don't think I would want to spend time in Wordsworth's company. Yeah. Uh, was or Robert sure. Lowell's company. Yeah, I didn't know or, if you were going to go in the, the Plutarch way of trying to at least contrast people who were more pleasant to be with than a... But was, no, no. Yeah. I could conceive of writing a biography of James Merrill, who's somebody I, I knew. Yeah. But that would be a hell of a lot of work. Like I say, Lanny will never forgive me for only reading two weeks. I would like to write a biography of Homer. Yeah. <laughs> or it would be the way Stephen Greenblatt wrote his biography, Will in the World, yeah. which is a great bestseller. He was derided and, and savaged by all the critics. Well, he was crying all the way to the bank sure. with this. Because on every page, there's a phrase that says, well, we like to imagine, or we, we, we might want to find Shakespeare here? Or wouldn't it be nice to think that Shakespeare was in the company? <laughs> we know nothing. We know yeah. nothing. Chaucer is another one about whom we know very little. What are you reading? Um, I don't know. I should have warned you. Although this is your fourth time, so you should have known that question was coming. So. Uh, I've just picked up my second Barbara Pym novel. Never read her. Uh, I read this apparently is an unusual one I just took this out of the local library and this apparently is not her most typical work but one I started with was Excellent Women and everybody I know mostly women uh, who is a Barbara Pym fan just worships her so mm -hmm. I've been reading her I read the last novel by Mary Gordon a wonderful novelist. Uh, this was called uh, Payback. And it's a novel that sort of fell under the radar because it was published during COVID. Hmm. But it's about reality TV, not a subject which I am invested in. Yeah. You did mention sitting around and watching TV during the pandemic as part of your, your enjoyment. So. The, the, thing, the, the greatest book that I've read recently is, uh, and this is a different obsession of mine, Jennifer Homan's magisterial biography of George Balanchine, whom I think of as the greatest creative genius of the 20th century. And because I was, and remain a little less so now, he's been dead for 40 years, uh, a fan of the New York City Ballet, I know the territory, but I didn't know the man until I read uh, Homan's book, which is extraordinary. And it complicates all of the ideas, talk about feminism, all of the ideas of men using women. Um, if you are a sculptor, you have clay to work with. If you are a composer, you have notes to work with. If you are a writer, you have words. If you are a choreographer, you have bodies. And you have to work on those bodies, with those bodies. You see the bodies, and you can say, oh, 
I think she could be good doing this. Balanchine always said, ballet is woman. And there's a lot of the Pygmalion and Galatea to this. Mm -hmm. He fell in love with these women. He married these women. He had affairs with these women. He was using these women in two different ways. He was using them as women, but he was using them as material. All of the women wanted to be his muse. Some of them would volunteer to be his mistress or wife. Others, the biggest one who got away was famously Suzanne Farrell, whom he was in love with, but who rejected him. It complicates the idea of male predator, me too, and woman as victim. Because they won one core ballet member whom I had met said, if I have to marry this man, I'm going to get him to make me a star. They were aggressive. They knew that if they could get the eye of the master, he would do wonderful things with them, for them, maybe to them. Uh, very complicated, very complicated. But masterpieces resulted. And as Balanchine always said, I didn't leave my wives, they left me. Yeah, I will tell you my Balanchine story when we're off mic so that uh, okay. I don't embarrass anybody. But, but anyway, that was, yeah. that was a great, great book. Yeah. I, I, I figure you're always going to turn me on to something that's, that's good to, because you and I first met because you had written an appreciation of The Leopard that's many right. years ago in, in the Wall Street Journal, and that mm -hmm. was the life-changing novel for me. I like to think. Um, Did I've, you read the novel before you saw the film? Because yeah, I saw the I didn't film see the first. for years. Oh. I, it took years before I, I watched the, the film. I had to get the Criterion long version of it. Our, our current dog, who uh, I think we yeah we, we have met since we've gotten him, um, is named Bendico after after the prince's dog, uh, the hunting dog. And in, this, in the book. And this but, you always have. Would you have greyhounds? Boys, boys, greyhounds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we're one greyhound, and uh, the first two were named after Groucho Marx characters. But this one, we decided mm -hmm. uh, once Amy got to read the leopard too, and decided. Yeah, that's that's you know a dog we should honor with a with, with a name. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Anyway, Willard, thanks so much for for coming back on the show. I am great well, pleasure. I'm in awe of the book, and I'm, thank I thank you. The publisher actually sent me two copies, so I've got somebody uh, a big Clampett fan. I'm going to be sending this one to right after. But. And that was Willard Spiegelman. Go get his amazing new biography, Nothing Stays Put, The Life and Poetry of Amy Clampett, from Knopf. Um, it is out now, which is Tuesday, February 28th, 2023, for you time travelers out there. It's a remarkable piece of work, and I hope we got across some of what makes the book and Amy's poems so special. I mean, Willard really manages to evoke the utterly idiosyncratic life of a great poet who, who discovered herself and was discovered late. Now, Willard does not have a web presence. There is an Amy Clampett website, but there is no WillardSpiegelman.com. Um, but you can find more of his books and writing online. He still reviews at the Wall Street Journal, I think, and elsewhere. Um, and we've done several episodes over the years about some of his other books, uh, Seven Pleasures, Senior Moments, and If You See Something, Say Something. Uh, the last one is tough to find because it's a university press, but it's a really neat collection of, of his reviews of art museums. So go check out Willard's work, go check out our past conversations and see how this one measures up, and go get Nothing Stays Put, the life and poetry of Amy Clampett. Now, you can support the Virtual memory Show by telling other people about it. Let them know there is this podcast comes out every week with this weird guy having these great conversations with writers and artists and, and biographers and editors and translators and musicians and cartoonists and, and all sorts of creative folks. You can also help out the show by telling me what you like and don't like about it and who you'd like to hear me record with or what movie or TV show or book or piece of music or theater or art exhibition or opera or, or ballet or whatever you think I should turn listeners on to. You can do that by sending me a postcard or a letter or an email or a DM or by leaving a message on my Google voice number, which is 
That goes directly to voicemail, so you don't have to worry about getting stuck in an awkward conversation with me. And messages can be up to three minutes long. So if you're going to go longer than that, it's just going to cut you off. Call back, leave a second message. And let me know if it'd be okay to include your message in an upcoming episode of the show. You might have something interesting to share with the listeners, but I would never include that without the speaker's permission. So uh, let me know. If you've got money to spare, don't give it to me. I mean, this one cost a, a little money because I, I drove into the city had to do the, the toll at the GW, parked near uh, uh, Willard's place. Um, he and his partner, Ken, took me out for lunch afterwards, so I didn't have to pay for a meal. But still, I went on from there to the, the Whitney and saw the, uh, the Hopper exhibition and all sorts of stuff I'm not telling you about during the episode. But anyway... I don't need the money. I, I work really hard. I get paid pretty well. Uh, but other people do. And you can help out individuals or institutions in need if you've got a little bit to spare. So um, look for people through GoFundMe, Patreon, Kickstarter, Crowdfunder, or other crowdfunding platforms. And there are people you can find who, who need help with medical bills or rent or an artistic project they're trying to get off the ground or or surgery for their dog or, or something important to them. So you can't help people if you've even got just $5 to, to spare. If you want to help with institutions or foundations, I give to my local food bank, occasionally give to the Poor People's Campaign, uh, their Freedom Funds, Election Funds, uh, Planned Parenthood and Women's Choice Funds. Uh, I make targeted election contributions because I'm a lobbyist and that's part of what I do. But what I'm, I'm trying to get across is there's a lot you can do if you've got a little bit to, to spare to, to try to help build a better world. So um, I hope you will. Our music for this episode is Fella by Hal Mayforth. Use with permission from the artist. You should visit my archives to check out my episode with Hal from the summer of 2018 and learn more about his art and painting. And you can listen to his music at soundcloud.com slash Mayforth. And that's M-A-Y, the number four, T-H. And that's it for this week's episode of the Virtual Memories Show. Thanks so much for listening. We'll be back next week with another great conversation. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find all our episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can also follow the Virtual Memory Show on Twitter and Instagram at vmspod, at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com, and on YouTube, Spotify, and TuneIn.com by searching for Virtual Memories Show. And if you like this podcast, please tell your pals, talk it up on social media, and go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and maybe a review for us. It all goes to helping us build a bigger audience. Now, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth. Keep reading, keep making art, and keep the conversation going. <laughs> <laughs>